Hi everyone, we're back live at the Guidewell Insights Lounge. My name is Kate Warnock, and we are here at day three of Singularity University's Exponential Medicine. I'm delighted to have one of our main stage speakers here with us today, Ms. Corey Lathan. Corey, welcome to the interview. Thank you. Corey is the co-founder and CEO of Anthrotronics. Corey, you know, you talk about focusing on health, not health care. What does that mean and how do you hope that will shift our perspective? Well, I think um, that we're a really interesting convergence of, uh, of, of events, for lack of a better word. Um, we have you know, the Affordable Care Act, which has shifted us from fee-for-service to, I think, what they call value-based. I'm, I'm not a healthcare person. I'm a technologist. Uh, but so we have this shift in our healthcare focus. We also have unprecedented access to technology and data. So I think those three things, the, the amount of data that we have, both from our active interactions with our environment, um, as well as passive monitoring, as well as the, the techno technological literacy um, that, that abounds, I think that's a really interesting convergence. And so I think that's going to enable us to make that shift from this treatment, you know, diagnosis and treatment, to wellness and prevention. You know, I think that your, your response reminds me of another guest that we had on here at the Insights Lounge where they were talking about technology <coughs> and specific, specifically monitoring technology being ambient in that it could be mm -hmm. in your health, mm -hmm. in your home, in your car, a sensor that you might wear, but you're not even aware of, of the fact that it is there gathering that right. intelligence and, and feeding into something larger. So I totally agree with you that this could really be a game changer. Yeah, absolutely, and and you know I, I won't repeat what I said uh, on the main stage, but um, we we all know about the Internet of Things, but what we forget is behind every thing there's a person and there's a behavior that that device is responding to. Right. So I think even from that perspective, it's it's an incredible amount of, of data that's reflective of, of human behavior. Absolutely, and I think you know again you're you you hit on another theme that's been just resonating so much here throughout the conference and that's around the human side of, of technology and the mm -hmm. fact that we can have all of the the most amazing bleeding edge technology but that we have to keep the humanity really front and center for that to, to um, you know be more meaningful and probably adopted as well I'm yep. sure that you can appreciate that yep all right Corey what is your vision of healthcare five years from today well, you know, we talk about the exponential curve of, of, of change at this conference, and, and I think we need to get ahead of that curve when we talk about um, health. Um, if we can get ahead of the curve of accelerating uh, disease, like things like dementia, then we can actually prevent and, in essence, cure, cure disease. If we can get a ahead of that, and so prevent it before it ever happens. If we can keep ourselves healthy, keep our cells healthy, keep our, you know, our, our, our minds healthy, then we're actually gonna be in a, in a state very soon where we're, we're, we haven't just addressed uh, uh, disease, we've, we've cured it. That's a very exciting response, honestly. I mean, to think of it in, in such a way. Uh, do, you, you've, do you see that in the next five years? Is that really something that we'll see in our lifetime? Um, I'm a techno optimist, <laughs> so I think that there's I think there's enough. We have the tools, you know. We have we we have the we have the technology. We can rebuild her. Uh, sorry, no one is like everyone's going to be too young in your audience to get that reference. But, I caught that. Um, yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean we have the tools. So it's really how fast can we implement them? Actually, okay. So bionic yeah. woman for anyone who wants to know. <laughs> bionic woman, check it out. All right, uh, Corey, another question. Uh, what does the empowered patient of tomorrow look like? <clears throat> you know, we, we've come such a long way in terms of um, being able to monitor our own health. I mean, think about even blood pressure cuffs and, and I mean, you know, obviously we've had thermometers for a long time, but it's fairly recent where, you know, you can actually get an, uh, a, an iPhone add-on that will let you know if you're having um, cardiac arrhythmia. You know, my, my father um, has atrial fibrillation and he has an app. He's 75 years old and he uses an app to determine if he's an atrial fib. So <clears throat> I think when you start talking about that kind of 
um, access to being able to manage our own care. Uh, that's, that's a really incredible thing. And, and of course, my vision, it being in the area of, of brain health, is that that's the one area we actually do not have awareness and control over. We don't have any brain vital that either happens in the doctor's office or in the home. So where I think we need to go with the empowered patient is actually being able to manage your own brain health, which is affected by everything. I mean, sleep, stress, you know, disease states. Um, I mean, everything affects your brain and we have no way of measuring it. We have ways of measuring it, we just haven't empowered the patient. So that's what has to come next. You know, a few, um, a little while back, we had Stephen Keating on and, and you know, he's gonna be giving a presentation later <laughs> today and I know that that will resonate so much with you. He's a patient advocate after discovering mm -hmm. that he had a brain tumor yep. um, that developed over yep. a number of years. And where he became an advocate specifically is that he himself, you know, who happened to be, um, you know, he, he worked with the physicians closely uh, He's a, uh, a graduate student. Um, his clinicians were able to access the data that they had yep. on him in a beautifully, as he said, you know, these beautiful images. If he asked for it himself, it would come to him a month later on 30 different CDs, the PDFs and things that were just indecipherable. So yep. as a technologist, you know, I'm sure that you can appreciate and, and probably really advocate as well for the fact that everyone should have access to their own data. Absolutely. I, I've heard Stephen speak before and his story is really incredible and is a great case study of what we should all have access to um, and, uh, and, and on a daily basis. I mean, if he, if, you know, if, if his doctor had tracked his brain vital as obsessively as I'm sure his body mass index was tracked from the time he was born, right. maybe he would have had earlier indications. I, I don't know that, but right. it's just an example to say, you know, we're, we're tracking so much of our body function, but we're not tracking brain health. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting to me. What is it then? Is it, what's, what's been a barrier in us being able to monitor that? As you said, there's no real indicator in the doctor's office. Is, where do we advance so that there is? Well, you know, it's, um, it's, it's complicated. It's actually, there's, there's, technologically, we have tools. We have paper pencil assessment tools. We have reaction time testing, which is what we do. We have um, EEG, which is becoming more and more mainstream. So what, ha what has really happened is that brain health has been the purview of specialists. And specialists have kind of protected that space. And, and, you know, for good reason. I mean, every, you know, when, especially when fields emerge like neuropsychology, um, you know, they have a, a wide range of tools and know how best to use them when those tools are early on. You know, that's, it, it, so for example, if you go to your doctor and you say, you know, I really feel like I'm having memory issues. I feel like it's beyond normal. I, I'm having memory issues. And you, and you somehow convince your doctor, because it's actually not easy to do, to have them give you a referral to go get your memory test, well then you, you know, call and schedule an appointment with a specialist and maybe three months later you get your evaluation and then you go in and for three hours they'll do a whole set of all, some, maybe some computerized, some paper pencil and what your doctor will get back is no mild cognitive impairment or mild cognitive impairment. Right. You know, we did that with my, my father who, you know, has the atrial fib and he has cardiovascular disease and, and is affecting, he's getting older. Sure. And so we did that because he has mild cognitive impairment and we get back the information, mild cognitive impairment. It's like, well, no kidding. That's why we sent him. Right. You know, so six months later, Thanks we have no more information. What we knew. Right. Yeah, we have no more information than we did. Any tool, I mean, the, but the issue is, as long as we use it as a three-hour diagnostic, it's going to have to remain the purview of specialists because they're going to have to understand how to integrate that with your history. But if it had been part of your checkup every year, or at least every year since he had turned 50, mm -hmm. maybe his doctor could have said, you know what, you have fallen off your curve. You have mild cognitive impairment. And we need to address that now, not in six months. You know, Corey, I think that, you know, again, um, listening to you and, and uh, you know, the direct experience that you had with your father, you know, it, it's, it's a real case study of the democratization of health, which has, yep. again, been another theme here yeah. and that it is the time to bring in the patient and, and really keep them informed. Who's more interested in their health than the person who, who you know, who owns that? So, and their caregiver. 
And their caregiver, yes, great, great point. Yep. Um, not, not to be forgotten there too. So to enable the patient, the people that love and care for them, you know, to be as well informed as they possibly can mm -hmm. be, understanding that they're not physicians, they're not neuroscientists, but they absolutely can collaborate. And hopefully, you know, that three hour memory test Maybe it's it's a thing of the past, and in, in, in that next you know five years, yep. if we become more empowered and, yep. and really call for that change yep. and how care needs to be delivered. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. So one more question for you, and this is a fun one: If you could magically fix one specific problem in the healthcare system, what would it be? <laughs> Just one. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, uh, uh, it, it, it's supposed to be a fun one, but that's just so hard because, again, it's this whole issue of let's shift from healthcare to health. Let's get the doctors to help us to quantify healthy. You know, I, if I have a better understanding, me and my physician, my general practitioner, of what it is when I'm healthy, then we'll know if I'm not healthy. We'll have a, both of us will have a much better understanding of if I'm not healthy. Right, right. So yeah. I think that takes us back to your very first yeah. response where you were yeah. talking about we need to get ahead of these diseases that can be so debilitating and it's mm -hmm. just a matter of starting at the right time with the right tools and truly the right communication. Yep. It's, it, it is just, it's, it's everything, isn't it? Yep. So it's changing yep. the paradigm. Corey, it's been wonderful having you here. I'm sure that everybody was so thrilled to have you up on main stage. I know we're delighted to have you here at the Guidewell Insights Lounge. Thank you for sharing your perspective with us. Thank you so much. All right, my name is Kate Warnock. We're gonna be up again soon with another interview in just a moment.